Okay. If I if I were to put my finger on one of the key changes that has occurred in the past twenty years, as well as the radical decline in the standards of journalism, the the, the uh, uh, another key change that has occurred is that 20 years ago, the general public were by and large willing without question to accept an authoritative statement from a so-called expert. That is not the case today. Authoritative statements from so-called experts are a debased and devalued currency in the world of the 21st century, because we have learned that these authority figures, whether they're big government uh, figures or whether they're from the big corporations or even from the big religions, fundamentally, they lie to us all the time. And I think that this, this habit uh, of uh, political figures to lie and to spread, fill society with lies has led to, uh, rightly, to a questioning of the statements of authority figures. So when Professor X or Dr. Y stands up today and says, Hancock is wrong, uh, we have got the whole story of civilization worked out, Professor X or Dr. Y is not likely to be, to be believed by the majority of people today. And that was different 20 years ago. Mm. And, and just before we go off that point and we get into the meat of it, um, are you an angry man or a disappointed man more? I'm not angry mm. and I'm not disappointed. Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's unfortunate that the journalistic standards are so shoddy, but we've already dealt with that. Um, that's not my problem. The journalists themselves have to live with their poor work at the end of the day, not me. Um, I, it may it may be it may be damaging to me, but I would say in the long run, it's much more damaging to the journalist who who b b behaves like such a hack in 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 what they're doing. So I'm not actually angry, at, really, or disappointed in in anything. I'm excited encouraged and, and, and positive that I have had the opportunity in my life to explore the world, to study the most intriguing and magnificent and mysterious ancient sites, and to present possibilities about the past that do not appear to have been properly considered before. Uh, we have a, a, a huge establishment that I would say effectively controls our past, and that is mainstream history and archaeology, uh, the university departments associated with it, the entire teaching profession, um, which, which takes its ideas from the mainstream, and the media, which pick up on the mainstream. And I see myself as just one alternative voice, that, that my role is to provide an alternative take on what is known and what is not known about our past. And you know, the intriguing thing is that the further back you go, the further back you go beyond 5,000 years ago, the less is known about our past and the more uh, speculative become the attempts of archeologists to explain it. So I think an alternative point of view, well-reasoned, well-argued, coherent uh, and, and, and positive uh, has a place. And that's what I've sought to provide. But I'm not disappointed and I'm not angry, I expect I expect to have to face the fire of criticism, and I welcome that criticism as long as it's honest and comes from a good place. Tell me if I'm being fair and accurate here when I say that uh, the core premise then of, uh, of this book and the one that preceded it uh, some years ago uh, is that we arose, what we are today, arose from what was almost pretty much so an extinction size and style event, but it wasn't quite that. Am I correct there? Well, you're broadly correct. This is, this is one of the new developments uh, that has taken place in the last decade, uh, which requires that we look again very carefully at everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization. Since 2007, a, a group of extremely serious, highly credentialed scientists, mainly geologists, but actually they include some archaeologists, they include experts in impact dynamics, they include oceanographers, uh, a, a broad international team of scientists have been carefully and methodically piecing together the evidence which proves, and I put the emphasis on the word prove because I think this has gone beyond an argument now, which proves that the Earth was hit by several fragments of a comet 12,800 
years ago. This is not some wild theory from Graham Hancock. This is material that has been published, for example, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, in the Journal of Geology, in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, and so on and so forth, uh, during the last decade, and which has built up a formidable, and I would say irrefutable, body of evidence uh, for truly an extinction-level event. Actually, there were two events. Uh, as we reconstruct the data, it appears that the Earth principally the North American ice cap, because 12,800 years ago, we were still in the ice age. The North American ice cap was hit by at least four fragments of this comet. And these fragments are not small. They're in the range of a, of a mile uh, in diameter. Uh, this happened 12,800 years ago. That uh, debris from the comet uh, carried on across the Atlantic. It came in, in a, from, from the northwest in a southeasterly direction, crossed what is now Canada and the northeastern part of the United States, crossed the Atlantic. There were further impacts on the northern European ice cap, and the furthest fallout that's been detected was as far east as uh, Syria. It appears that there were a second series of impacts 11,600 years ago. So we have a period of 1,200 years between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, where the Earth is plunged into a, a nightmare of flooding and fire and an earthquake and utter chaos and skies darkened and, and boiling and sea levels rising rapidly and just tremendous deluges tearing across the land as huge areas of the North American ice cap were, were liquidized. And this was an extinction level event. We know in that precise 1,200 year window between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago that there were enormous extinctions of animal species all around the world. And what I bring to the party with intriguing evidence from archaeological sites all around the world uh, is that we must consider the possibility that that extinction level event did not only affect hunter gatherers who lived on the earth at that time, for sure, just as they do today, did not only affect the animal species that became extinct, but also wiped out uh, an advanced civilization of prehistory that is now only remembered in myths and traditions all around the world. So this is archaeological evidence in the main. What about geological evidence? Well, this is, this is uh, the, for, first of all, the evidence for the comet impact is geological evidence, solid geological evidence. What, what, it, some, sometimes it's difficult for us to imagine the effect of uh, an object, a, a solid object, a mile wide, entering the Earth's atmosphere at 70,000 miles an hour. But um, if you were to imagine the entire nuclear arsenal of the Earth going up at once, that would be roughly similar to the consequences of that impact. It is, it is truly cataclysmic. You have tremendous heat and tremendous shock. And byproducts of this heat and shock include a number of specific signatures uh, in the strata of the Earth. And these signatures include nanodiamonds. The heat and the shock actually creates these tiny submicroscopic diamonds. Um, it includes carbon spherules. It includes melt glass, which is indistinguishable from the melt glass produced in nuclear explosions. Uh, it includes evidence of temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade distributed across a large part of the Earth's surface. 2,200 degrees centigrade, by the way, is the boiling point of quartz. Uh, th these are the geological signatures of a massive cosmic impact. And those signatures occur in this period between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Now, initially, the evidence for the comet impact was questioned because it was difficult to find a crater. This was also the case with an earlier controversy, which concerned the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. We now accept that the extinction of the dinosaurs was caused by a cosmic impact. Uh, but for a long time, that was disputed because Lewis and Walter Alvarez, the scientists behind the dinosaur extinction work, um, couldn't produce a crater. Eventually, the crater was found in the Gulf of Mexico, deeply, deeply buried and partially under the waters of the Gulf 
Gulf of Mexico. Um, but initially, their case was based entirely on the same impact proxies that the team of scientists are now showing have been spread all around the world during these events between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. So we have two episodes of massive extinction, one 65 million years ago, which has been known about for a long time, and one 12,800 years ago, which is very recent science that has hardly even entered into the, into the public uh, domain. Uh, and this is why I felt it was important to summarize and detail that science in several chapters of Magicians of the Gods, because this event is of fundamental importance, an extinction level event right in the backyard of history. And yet our notion of the origins of civilization so far has been formed without taking such an extinction level event into account. That requires us to think again about everything we know about the origins of civilization. And it also gives us a clarity that perhaps we didn't have before in that uh, everything has to have a starting point. And there in that interregnum period, in that uh, period between the first and second impact, you have effectively that starting point, that line in the sand. We do. We have that, we have that starting point because mysterious things uh, start to happen. And one of them is the incredible site, archeological site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Um, which was not discovered until the second half of the 1990s uh, and which has been excavated uh, since then. And we now know for sure that Gobekli Tepe dates back to precisely that cataclysmic period. And it goes back 12,000 years. And this is, this is really fascinating because what we see at Gobekli Tepe is a gigantic series of megalithic circles. Everybody has a picture in their mind of Stonehenge in the UK, okay? So take Stonehenge and multiply it by 50, and that's roughly what you're looking at at Gobekli Tepe. So far, only a tiny part of Gobekli Tepe has been excavated. Most of it's still under the ground, but we know that there are hundreds of huge megaliths lying under the ground because of a survey with ground penetrating radar. Now, here's the problem. Gobekli Tepe is 7,000 years older than Stonehenge but it is far more advanced and far more sophisticated. In the case of Stonehenge, we have a Neolithic culture from 5,000 years ago, which is already uh, fully developed agriculturally, which is generating surpluses, which can support the specialists who are needed to create the stone circles. In Gobekli Tepe, the context 12,000 years ago is entirely that of hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers have never before been considered capable of organization on a scale that is demonstrated at Gobekli Tepe, the site organization, the bringing of hundreds of workers to the site. This is a site with no water. They would have to be fed. They would have to be watered. The flow of pillars from the quarries to the sites would have to be organized. The astronomical alignments of the pillars, which are extremely precise, would have to be organized. And my point is, you don't just wake up one morning as a hunter-gatherer, suddenly and magically equipped with the skills to do this. What Gobekli Tepe looks like to me is a transfer of technology that a people from a more advanced culture who already knew how to do megalithic architecture settled amongst a community of hunter-gatherers in what is now Eastern Turkey and taught them the necessary skills. That's what we see at Gobekli Tepe, and therefore it's not an accident that at exactly the same time that the mysterious Gobekli Tepe megaliths are raised up, we find a massive dissemination of agriculture taking place in the, exactly the same region of Turkey. Uh, so another transfer of technology is suggested there, that incomers who already knew agriculture and who already knew how to make megalithic architecture brought the skills with them, established Gobekli Tepe as a center of innovation, and effectively attempted to restart their lost former world, but they did not succeed. So you're talking about a kind of capsule civilization um, who realized that, of course, they'd been through a terrible thing and had to pass on what they knew and what they had learned uh, to sustain themselves and to sustain the planet. And they gifted what they knew to these people who had uh, less ability. 
Well, it may have been a survival issue. Uh, you, you, you know, if our if if the world were hit today by several fragments of a giant comet, as happened twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, uh, I'm not at all sure that our highly complex technological civilization would survive. Uh, very few of us. We may have certain advanced skills and knowledge as individuals, but very few of us have the whole suite of skills that make it possible for us to survive in a post-apocalyptic world. We don't know how to farm. Most of us. Some of us do. We don't know how to build buildings. We don't know how to make machines. Each of us has a specialist skill which locks into other specialist skills. Break that apart, and suddenly you are looking at a very fragile kind of society, a high-tech society with very fragile bonds that could easily fall apart with the majority of the population incompetent to survive. That would not be true of hunter-gatherers. If you went to the Amazon rainforest, you would find hunter-gatherers whose lives would be unaffected by the cataclysm, who would be able to carry on doing pretty much what they do. They already know how to survive, as do the hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert in, in southern Africa also, for example, and, and a number of other hunter-gatherer people. So that's my suggestion of what happened 12,800 years ago, that just as in the world today, we have an advanced civilization coexisting with hunter-gatherers, so also 12, 000, before 12,800 years ago, we had an advanced, lost, now lost civilization coexisting with the hunter-gatherers who also existed on the planet at that time. And when that civilization was destroyed as a result of these comet impacts, there were survivors, and naturally they would go and settle amongst hunter-gatherers, transfer some of what they knew to the hunter-gatherers, but perhaps also depending on the hunter-gatherers for their own livelihood. And what sorts of artifacts from those people, if we can call them people, um, have been or may be found? There's, a, there's just a vast range of material. And this is why I say we need to look again at everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization. It may be that we are missing clues because we're so convinced that there could have been no high civilization during the Ice Age. We aren't looking for that. And if you, if you start a project firmly convinced that the thing you're looking for doesn't exist, then you're most unlikely to find it. <laughs> but if you, if, if, you, if you start with the idea that this is a possibility, then various bits of evidence start to thrust themselves forward. For example, ancient maps. Uh, ancient maps, uh, by and large, these are maps that have come down to us because in the 15th and 16th centuries, they were copied from older source maps, which were then falling apart and which are now lost. In the process of copying from the older source maps onto the maps that have survived today, certain information about the world uh, was, was also copied. And what we see are images of the world very much as it looked during the last ice age, not in the 15th or 16th century, but as it looked during the last ice age. And I would suggest that that is a legacy of the source maps, that we are looking at source maps that go back to a lost civilization that was exploring the world, that was navigating, that had the technology to create good global maps during the ice age more than 13,000 years ago. These maps include accurate latitudes and longitudes. And to find accurate longitudes uh, on maps before the late 18th century is very puzzling because we did not have the technology to draw such maps until the late 18th century. Uh, these maps frequently feature Antarctica, yet Antarctica was not discovered until the year 1818. So the, 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 these ancient maps are in themselves a huge body of evidence that there was a pre-existing civilization that had navigated, explored, and mapped the world, at least to the standards that we were capable of doing in the late 18th or early 19th century of our era. In other words, a civilization that was vastly more advanced than is given credit for during the Ice Age when it is, has been thought that only hunter-gatherers existed on the planet. And where does the notion of Atlantis and the reality of ancient Egypt uh, tie into all of this? Well, the notion of Atlantis comes to us from a very specific source, and that specific source is the Greek philosopher Plato. Um, in his Timaeus and Critias dialogues, uh, Plato presented us with the single surviving account of Atlantis from which all subsequent accounts have been drawn. Uh, 
Um, and here's how Plato tells the story. Uh, he says that his ancestor, Solon, the famous Greek lawmaker, made his way to Egypt um, some uh, century and a half before Plato's time, made his way to Egypt. Uh, and there he went to a temple in the Delta at a place called Sais, a temple dedicated to the goddess Neith. And he was uh, told the story of Atlantis by the priests of that temple who pointed to hieroglyphs written on the walls of the temple and said the story of Atlantis uh, was there. Now, Archaeologists just dismiss the Plato Atlantis story entirely. In the archaeological lexicon, uh, an Atlantologist comes even lower than a pyramidiot. <laughs> Um, they, they totally ignore it. They say Plato made the whole thing up. Of course, um, there was no such civilization of Atlantis. But here's the interesting thing. When Plato talks about Atlantis, remember the tradition was passed down to him by his ancestor Solon. He tells us a key piece of information. He says that the submergence of Atlantis in a single terrible day and night of earthquakes and humongous floods took place 9,000 years before the time of Solon. That is 9,600 BC. That is 11,600 <laughs> years ago. So that that's pretty precise. accurate on the timings then. That is absolutely accurate on the timing. In fact, it's precisely the date of the second series of impacts that we know were accompanied by massive global flooding. So if Plato made that up, uh, he was astonishingly accurate to the latest uh, science in, in geology. Um, I, I, I think we have to take, take seriously the possibility that he was passing on to us a genuine tradition. Egyptologists will complain that the word Atlantis does not appear in any ancient Egyptian text, and that's true. But if you go to the Temple of Horus at Edfu, in Upper Egypt, uh, you will find the Edfu building texts. And those texts, which were copied from earlier documents that had fallen apart, uh, those texts tell the story of a primeval island of the gods, where was present an advanced, sophisticated, highly spiritual civilization that was destroyed in a cosmic cataclysm, leaving only a few survivors <laughs> who traveled around the world attempting to restart their former civilization. And we're talking about a remarkable achievement here, and it's set into context by something that was in the news, I think, two or three days ago here in the UK. Uh, a big debate about whether to, I think it was, renew the contract or keep printing, uh, keep preparing uh, laws in the UK on vellum. And the, the people who make vellum, the paper, effectively, that these things are written on, it's not really paper, um, are guaranteeing it for 500 years. Right. Now, you think about that in the context of your 11 and 12,000 year cycle you're talking about here. Yeah. And the people who make our laws are saying that our laws will survive, they can guarantee for 500 years. That shows us a lot, doesn't it, Graham, about the fragility of, of societies like that one, but particularly ours. We have the problem here. Absolutely. This is the, this is the thing, you see. If, you, if your project is to communicate to the future, to communicate information to the future, written information may not be the way to go. Uh, it, let's say that you would like a message to survive for 10,000 years, to pick a number, uh, and to be intelligible after 10,000 years. Writing it down in the English language on a piece of vellum uh, probably wouldn't be the way to go. As, we, as you've just informed us, vellum uh, ceases to be useful after 500 years. It, 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 it can only be guaranteed for, for, for 500 years. And who's to say in 500 or 5,000 or 10,000 years from now that anybody will be able to decipher the English language. Right now, it can be deciphered, but we have ancient scripts, for example, the Indus Valley script in, in northern India, uh, which uh, to this day has, has never been deciphered. So a script is not a great way to communicate a message. What you want is a, is a universal language which can be decoded by any moderately sophisticated culture uh, at any time in the future. And that's why I'm very interested in the use of extremely large monuments like the pyramids and the Sphinx combined with astronomical alignments uh, to draw our attention again and again precisely to this period between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. It happens at Giza in Egypt. The pyramids and the Sphinx are a map of the sky at dawn on the spring equinox 
years ago, uh, down roughly to 11,500 years ago. Uh, we have uh, a pillar at Gobekli Tepe, which actually contains a picture of the winter solstice sky. But weirdly, in our epoch, with the sun sitting between the constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpio, astride the dark rift in the, in, in the Milky Way, it appears to me that a, a, a substantial effort has been made by these mysterious predecessors of ours to communicate with us. I actually think Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried as a time capsule. I think the intention was that it was not to be found for a very long time. And it's really spooky and strange that it has been found in precisely the epoch that is signaled by Pillar 43 in Enclosure D at Gobekli Tepe. This tells us one very important thing, doesn't it? That these people, this civilization, were more savvy and more intelligent than we are today because they were able to work out that in order to continue themselves, in order to pass on the knowledge, the way that you had to do that was not the ways that we would do that. And that is, that, that, that is right. a problem for us, isn't it? They understood they needed to find a, a universal language. Actually, to give you a crass example of this, a crass modern example, uh, the Hoover Dam in the United States incorporates a, a, an enormous star map uh, in, into its architecture. Uh, that star map freezes the skies over the Hoover Dam at the moment of the completion of the Hoover Dam. Uh, and it was put there deliberately with the intention that in 10,000 years from now, people would be able to work out when the Hoover Dam was, was, was made. Um, and I'm suggesting that the same thing is, uh, is, is happening at Giza. It's not even an extraordinary idea. It's something that our culture uh, has done uh, in the Hoover Dam and, and uh, has been done at Giza. And the message is, pay attention to the period between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago in your epoch. What about the notion that if we're talking about ancient Egypt here, which I've always found fascinating, and you know, I've spoken to people like Robert Beval, who I know that you've worked with extensively on all of this. What a very, very good friend of mine. We've worked together very closely. We've been in the trenches <laughs> together, um, doing battle with the archeologists for more than 20 years. Yes, and doing battle with the media, I think, together at one point, but that's a whole other story. Um, that's a whole other story, yeah. The, the notion that, yes, we know, about the, we know a certain amount about the ancient Egyptians, but the idea now that is gaining some currency at the moment that there was a civilization before them uh, who came up from further south um, mm -hmm. and w basically inspired the people that we know as the ancient Egyptians and what they created. What do you make to that? Well, I think there's two issues here. One is the one is the peopling of uh, Egypt. Um, where where did the peoples of Egypt uh, of ancient Egypt uh, originally come from? Their language belongs to the Hamitic language family. It's closely related to languages like um, Afar, Somali, um, Oromo uh, in the in, in the Horn of Africa. There un undoubtedly are deep African origins to ancient Egyptian civilization. Um, but the, the notion enshrined in the ancient Egyptian texts of a period that they call Zep Tepi, the first time, uh, which, which can, using astronomy, can be very precisely dated back to the epoch just beyond 12,000 years ago. In other words, exactly the, the epoch that we're focusing on here. Um, that contains so many references to arrivals by sea, to seagoing peoples, to navigation, that I think the story is, is more complicated. There is a huge African element in the origins of Egyptian civilization, but I think that there's something else uh, as well. And, and again, if you go back to the Edfu building texts, it appears that, Edf, that Egypt was selected as, um, as the first place in which the attempt would be made to rebuild or reincarnate or, or restore uh, the former world of the gods. Another point worth, worth bearing in mind, uh, Howard, in, in, in the construction of these gigantic monuments that incorporate astronomical messages that draw our attention to an epoch in the past, um, is that we are 
almost certainly dealing with people who believed in reincarnation. And this may sound very mystical and woo-woo, but uh, I, I, I make no comment on whether reincarnation happens or not. But let's say that, that for sure we're dealing with people who believed that it happened. If you believe that reincarnation happens, then you believe that you drink the waters of forgetfulness before you're born into this life, into this physical incarnation. The deal with reincarnation is that you don't remember your previous incarnations. And I sometimes wonder if these monuments uh, were created as a kind of mnemonic device uh, to wake up reincarnated initiates uh, mm -hmm. at, some, at some later time in the future, to trigger a memory, to start a process of inquiry and of, and of self-initiation. Um, the, the ancient world was um, deeply focused on, on spiritual matters. Uh, I'm often asked, you know, what would be the difference between the lost civilization that I'm proposing and, and our civilization today? Um, and I would say the differences were, were huge. Uh, yes, this lost civilization did have technological abilities, the manipulation of gigantic blocks of stone, the creation of those maps, the, the careful and precise observations of the heavens, all of these are, are science. But fundamentally, this was, a, this was a civilization that focused on the spiritual essence of humanity uh, and, and on creating conditions in, that, in which that can be developed and, and magnified. And we see this again in the Atlantis story. Plato, Plato tells us that Atlantis, for a very long time, was a great and good civilization, uh, very, very, very generous, sh sharing, uh, devoted to the, the, the spirit. Uh, but then gradually the rot crept in, something changed, the Atlanteans became cruel and, 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 and harsh and, and callous. They ceased to bear their prosperity with moderation. Um, and, and eventually the cataclysm was brought down upon them, uh, the, the traditions suggest, in, in, in punishment for their lapse from their former high spiritual state. Do you think we should read into this that all great civilizations, and we perhaps foolishly consider ourselves today to be a great civilization, ultimately become arrogant, which is what the Atlanteans uh, seem to have become, and ultimately that will sow the seeds of their downfall? And there's a lesson in that for us. There's an absolute lesson in that for us, and I think I think we can see it it happening now. And it's one of the reasons why uh, I feel it's important to get this message out and 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 to help people to understand that the story of the origins of human civilization is not settled and done for and and fully established by archaeology at all. There are huge question marks over it, and those question marks actually touch on what it is to be human uh, and, and, and where we're going next with our, with our lives. See, we've been taught to regard ourselves as the apex and the pinnacle of human achievement. Thousands of years of, of physical and social evolution have led to us. You know, we're sitting there at the top of the, at the, top of the heap, and that is a very arrogant place to be psychologically if we think of ourselves as such. If we understand that a former high civilization, in many ways every bit as high and advanced as our own, existed on this planet and was wiped out in a global cataclysm, perhaps we might not be so sure and so confident and so arrogant uh, about our own uh, stability. In many ways, we do look in mythological terms like the next lost, lost civilization. We, we, we tick all the boxes. We have the arrogance. We have the cruelty. We have the severing of our connection with spirit. Surely one of the most devastating um, aspects of the human experience during the, the, the last 200 years, the, the severing of connection to spirit. We live in a... In a Actually, dry are being made to make this this world as spiritually dry as possible to define all matter as dead as lacking in any soul or or, or meaning um, this is the this is the, the the situation that we confront today and the mainstream religions don't help the mainstream religions are not providing or reconnecting us to spirit. They also are huge bureaucracies run mainly by uh, men uh, who, who impose themselves as intermediaries between ourselves and the divine. I think that there's a whole range of habits of behavior that are locked into modern society which no longer serve us and which we need to jettison if we are not to destroy ourselves 
in the coming century or so. And that was the thing that, I'm sorry to interrupt, Graham, but the thing that, that really excited me about uh, the research that I was doing into, into your work uh, prior to this, this conversation, the thing that I think excited me more than the discovery that uh, <laughs> there was a civilization much older than we thought uh, could possibly have existed and our ideas of where we came from and all the rest of it completely wrong. What excites me more than anything else is what flows from, from your work and what you are saying underneath all of this, and that is that we have a lot of learning to do and that we need to learn ways to predict things that may happen to us, that may destroy us, but we also need to find ways of, like the, the Hoover Dam you were talking about, of forwarding the knowledge that, uh, that we have. Because in this electronic digital society where everything is chuck away and nobody cares about anything, um, any possibility of that seems to be going rapidly out of the window. But more important than any of that, and it's a very simple thing, is love. That's more important than any of that. The, the great crisis of the modern world is the, the wide dissemination of fear and hatred and suspicion. Um, and that is being manipulated and exploited by big corporations and big governments and the big religions to divide us from one another. What's needed is the realization, the recognition that we are truly all brothers and sisters with a common cause that we all share, which is the incredible gift of our humanity and the responsibility to use that gift well. The, the modern world absolutely needs a, a, a wake-up call. We need to understand that we live in a magical and enchanted universe, not a dead universe that is simply there for us to exploit. We need to learn to bear our prosperity with moderation. But above all else, our societies need to learn to act with love rather than to act out of fear and hatred and suspicion. I totally agree. One of the themes that uh, arose from one of the conversations of yours that I listened to 24 hours ago, uh, and I have heard hints of this before, was the tantalizing idea that you referred to Egyptologists so-called, um, that some of those people are actually doing explorations that we don't get to hear anything about and may have made discoveries that could be very material and may well tie into what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, I'm afraid that's, I'm afraid that's possible. Um, they, they, and, and in fact, it's part of the consistent track record of, of uh, archaeology. Uh, secret excavations uh, do go on to serve particular interests. The public is not told everything about what is happening in the realm of archaeology. And uh, I, I think that's particularly evident uh, on the Giza Plateau in, in Egypt. Surely uh, one of the greatest archaeological prizes uh, in, in the world. Um, I have, in a series of books, for example, Keeper of Genesis that Robert Boval and I wrote together back in 1996, um, which is titled The Message of the Sphinx in the, in, in, in the US. We looked at the, 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 the background of people like Dr. Zahi Hawass, who for, for decades has had pretty much full control of the Giza Plateau, of archaeology on the Giza Plateau, and of his colleague, Mark Lehner, who um, f formerly at the University of, of Chicago. We go into all of this in, in detail, and I must say there's some very interesting and, and intriguing and puzzling things happen at Giza. Uh, of, of course, um, part of the, uh, the success of a great secret is that you don't know what the secret is, but the feeling that, that something is going on behind the scenes at Giza and that we are not being told about it uh, is solidly grounded uh, in, in events. You've talked and written about consciousness a great deal and apart from the research you've done about our antecedents and the research that you've done and the things that you've written about uh, the importance of love and the importance of understanding who we are and what we are, you have talked about consciousness and yeah, well, let's be let's be clear first of all about uh, about the different strands of my work. Um, we're primarily sit primarily sitting down today to discuss mm. a, a new book that I published, which is Magicians of the Gods, mm. uh, which is the sequel to my best known book, which was Fingerprints of the Gods. Fingerprints of the Gods was published in 1995. Magicians of the Gods in 2015. And the reason I published Magicians of the Gods is some of the the, the information we've shared in this discussion, but so much more new evidence that strongly supports the case for a lost civilization more than 12,000 years ago. Separately, I have a whole other area of interest, which is in the mystery of consciousness uh, and in 
the role of altered states of consciousness uh, in human societies and human civilization and in individual human lives. Our society today is a society that demonizes uh, psychedelics. But ancient civilizations, pretty much all of them, made deliberate, careful, targeted use of psychedelics to contact the realm of spirit. It was a, a, a science in, in those societies. Psychedelics were not regarded as uh, uh, dreadful or dangerous things, but rather regarded as allies that help us to nurture and develop the spiritual side of ourselves. And of course, this is the case with shamanism. Uh, if you go off to the Amazon jungle, as I did when I was researching my book, Supernatural, which is the main book that I've written on this subject, um, I, you know, I find myself amidst shamanistic cultures that drink the powerful psychedelic brew mm -hmm. ayahuasca. Uh, and, and naturally, as a good working journalist, uh, I drink the ayahuasca as well, because I want to know what this experience is about. And it's an experience, frankly, that changes my life. I carry on. Um, I write my book. Uh, but but after having written the book and done perhaps 11 ayahuasca journeys in, in as research for that book, I then carried on subsequently uh, drinking ayahuasca every year because uh, I, I find it such a valuable healing medicine. And do you believe, because I have known people who have been to the places that you've been and done that, um, mm -hmm. do you believe truthfully, truly, that it is something that opens up a portal or really is there a gray area there could it just be messing with your brain oh it could it could be of course mm. um I, I i just think that's most unlikely the, the 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 probability at the moment uh is that we've misunderstood the brain that the brain is more a receiver or a transceiver of consciousness than a generator of consciousness and that what the powerful psychedelics particularly dimethyltryptamine which is part of the ayahuasca brew what the powerful psychedelics do is they retune the receiver wavelength of the brain to allow us to gain access to other levels of reality that are normally closed off from our senses. We don't have time to go into this now, but there's a vast amount of evidence uh, for, that, for that proposition. Um, and therefore, I believe, uh, it, as part of the efforts to understand the nature of reality, which include the exploration of outer space, we should also be exploring inner space and the mysterious encounters that occur in visionary states. Yes, they may just be our brain on drugs. But the evidence is compelling that they are far more than that, and that these may be vehicles for making contact with intelligent entities, perhaps from other dimensions. The research needs to be done. The science needs to be done. Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico, professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico, did research with human volunteers in the 1990s and DMT. And that research did strongly support the possibility that we are dealing with freestanding completely real parallel universes inhabited by intelligent entities that can only communicate with us when we are in a deeply altered state of consciousness, not when we're in the alert problem-solving state of consciousness that we use for everyday matters. The segment of the conversation we've just had about uh, altering consciousness and using certain uh, herbal substances so to do is, as you well know, because you're in the UK, uh, a conversation that's very, very difficult to have. I mean, most broadcasting organizations that I've worked for and with don't really allow you to, to go very close to this at all for the reasons that we both understand that there are a lot of idiots out there and we don't want to be encouraging people who are rather stupid to misuse these things. No, 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 no. This is so patronizing. We have to, we have to give credit to other adults, you know. We can't put ourselves in a position where we're making decisions for, for other adults about what they need to know. That's the death of freedom of speech. The moment, the moment that we start protecting our audiences from facts, that's the end of the freedom of speech. That's the that's the paternalistic model stepping stepping back in. Uh, it's it's really most unfortunate that that these subjects cannot be discussed, particularly when there are dazzling research breakthroughs now taking place with psychedelics, which are being proven to be powerful agencies of healing, particularly for people with post traumatic stress disorder or uh, terminal cancer patients given psilocybin and losing their fear of death. They're incredible 
research is being done. So, you know, if the broadcasting organizations are really seeking to impose a fatwa over these kind of discussions, they're making a huge mistake and they're out of step with history. I, I think the concern is always, and I understand this because I've been schooled in this all of my life and career, that you don't want to be encouraging people to play with substances that may ultimately do them harm. Well, we better tell people never to drive a car then. <laughs> I don't even have an answer or the beginnings of one for that. Um, but it does seem to me, and you tell me what you think, that this is very much one for academia uh, before you start unleashing these things on people. These things are already unleashed on people. I mean, what are you talking about, Howard? We live in a we live in a society where psychedelics are are actually widely available. They're illegal, which means they're surrounded with with fear and paranoia. But they're available. Anybody can get them. You know, the present system of controlling these substances is utterly broken. It doesn't work. We need a new system, and part of that new system involves open and free and honest conversation and respect for the intelligence of other adults. And if a child of yours said, I want to go to South America and talk with the shaman and open up portals of consciousness by imbibing ayahuasca, you'd be completely cool with that? I'd say wait till you're 21. Mm. I've drunk ayahuasca with uh, almost all of my six children. But in every case, we waited until they passed the age of 21. I think that the psychedelics are extremely serious matter. Uh, and I think they uh, are properly and rightly reserved for adults. At the moment, with this absurd and evil thing called the war on drugs, we have psychedelics being delivered to children by criminal gangs. I believe that if the psychedelics were made legal, we could control the access of children to them much more effectively than we do at present. Mm. And there's, there's a lot of hypocrisy, I think, also in this field. You know, there are people uh, running major organizations, I am sure, who uh, say one thing and do another. But that, we've had, again... We've had, we've had some recent examples of that. <laughs> we, indeed we have. Mm. Bringing you back, um, rightly, to the subject of the new book, what do you hope, what's your best hope for what it will be, what it will achieve and how it will be received? In other words, what do you want it to do? What I'd like the book to do is to reopen the debate over the origins of civilization, uh, to have presented enough evidence, solidly enough, seriously supported, uh, as I have attempted to do in this book, to make it impossible to ignore this, that, that there's something wrong with the story we're telling ourselves about the origins of civilization. Something is missing. We are a species with amnesia. And I'm hoping that the book will help to waken people up and, and lead to more serious inquiry uh, into this possibility. Because as I've said, if you start out examining a possibility with the conviction that that possibility cannot exist, then you won't find anything. You have to have some openness of spirit in order to make inquiries into these forbidden areas. Do you feel a weight of responsibility on your shoulders? You know, some people are saying these things, but they don't have the profile and the credibility that you have. Yeah, I do feel a weight of responsibility on my on my shoulders. It's a responsibility to to my readers. Uh, it's a responsibility to do the very best I can uh, to get this information across uh, and 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 not to be discouraged and not to be beaten down, but to keep on going. Because sooner or later, as the ancient Egyptians said, the truth is great and mighty, uh, and the truth of our past will emerge. Two listener questions that have come in, and I promised these people that I would try and put these to you. Uh, number one is from somebody called Stephen Ward. Stephen, uh, this is your question. Uh, listening to one of Graham's talks on YouTube, he mentions the pyramids and the Sphinx having an almost magnetic attraction for so many people. I've felt this since I first became aware of them, and I'd like to know why Graham thinks that is. Oh, well, I've been visiting Giza for quarter of a century. Um, and that has given me many opportunities to see the looks on the faces of those who stand in front of the Great Pyramid for the first time and to hear their conversations. Uh, and my experience has been that these people have been drawn from all over the world by a kind of call that the Great Pyramid seems to send out. It is a, it is a, a beacon. Um, and, and fundamentally, the Great Pyramid is about human consciousness, and it's still working on human consciousness today, even though we lack the surrounding um, edifice of ancient Egyptian civilization. 
You have a marvellous turn of phrase, and I know that you can probably answer this one succinctly. And um, Joey asked this question. Could you ask, Graham, the difference between science and a word that you used at the top of this conversation, pseudoscience, and not what the obvious answer would be? What hard facts are there, says Joey, relating to his work, and can any of these be stood up to be real evidence and not just myths? And where does he think his work will eventually lead him? I counted, I think, four questions within that. Well, Joey... Yeah. In answer to Joey's question, that's why I've written Magicians of the Gods. <laughs> you know, all the facts are all the facts are in there. There's hundreds of footnotes. Every factual statement is referenced to the academic paper from which it is drawn. So go read the book, and uh, all your questions will be answered. One question: uh, the book launched in September, and I talked about that event uh, in Berkshire that that's I was. U yeah, that's UK. It was published on the 10th of September yeah. in the UK. Uh, and, but, but that's. As we speak, we are still awaiting U.S. publication, which happens on the 10th of November. Which it's was published in the U.S. on the 10th of November, and I'll be touring the U.S., giving giving talks all over the U.S. in November and early December. Well, I'm sure a lot of people, well, you know, a lot of people are going to want to see and hear you. Why why stagger the release in that way? Um, it's very good for me that the release is staggered because I can't be in two places at once, much as I would like to bilocate. It's not one of my skills. Uh, so it allows me to pay full attention to the UK release and then to pay full attention to the US release. But it, it, it wasn't done for my convenience. Um, it's, it's just that the US production schedule was a little bit slower than the UK one, that's all. Understood. When you talk to those people who queue up to get your autograph, your signature on their book, um, have you noticed a difference between people, say, 15 years ago when you were writing and now? Are they more savvy than they were? Yeah, the big difference I've noticed is that my, my readership has got younger. Um, and I'm very excited about that because that's where I see the hope of, of, of humanity is in the, the youth of our, our society, young adults. That's, that's where I see the future. Um, and, and I noticed that distinctly uh, in my events, that the, 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 the presence of inquiring open-minded young people is very strong element of any audience that I that I n now have